Hi, everybody. Uh, for those of you who may not know me, I'm Katie Karkek. I'm one of the pro programming librarians at the Scarsdale Public Library. Uh, thank you all for being here. I am so excited to have Bruce Goldfarb here to talk about his book, 18 Tiny Deaths, and to talk about the absolutely remarkable Francis Glassner Lee. Um, there will be time for Q&A afterwards, so you can either at the end unmute yourself and ask your questions directly, or you can put them in the chat and I can relay them to Bruce. So Bruce, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Thank you for everybody's patience. Uh, I think it's gonna be uh, real worthwhile. Hey, Victor, um, let me just uh, get this uh, presentation going and uh, I think you'll find it informative. You can see that? Yep. Okay, awesome. All right, um, so uh, uh, this is, wait a minute. There we go. This is where I work in Baltimore. Um, this is the Forensic Medical Center for the state of Maryland. It's a, a very cool place. It's really huge. It takes up an entire city block. It's a state-of-the-art facility. Um, it's basically a hospital for dead people is the way it, it, it's organized and run. Uh, we have laboratories, just like you find in a hospital. Uh, the, we have an x-ray department, just like in a hospital. We have a medical records department. Uh, this room is called neuropathology, where they study brain and spinal cord. Uh, it's my favorite room in the whole building. Uh, when you walk in, there are these really bright windows, the left and the right, and these give you a balconyized view into the autopsy rooms. We have two main autopsy rooms. Um, this is one of them. Uh, the, it's not like they show on the TV shows. There are always these shadowy subterranean spaces. Uh, it's a big open area. It's the size of a gymnasium, 50 feet long, 35 feet wide, two stories tall. Uh, this room has eight stations in it, and uh, there's eight stations in the other room. Uh, and um, the gallery along the side is where, uh, this is where uh, uh, students or police, uh, evidence technicians, if they have to wait to pick up evidence, they're actually not inside the room when the work is going on. There, there's actually a, a, a law on the books in Maryland that says that you may not be inside this room without the permission of the chief or his designee. And I'm his designee, so I can go inside this room. This room is the only place in the state of Maryland where I could tell a police officer that he has to move along or I'd have him arrested. I have not had the opportunity to pull that authority, but I hope one day that would be very cool. We also have specialized facilities. We have this training facility that was donated by Patricia Cornwell, the novelist. It's basically a studio apartment where we, I should have given you a trigger warning, simulated injuries, nobody's actually hurt. These are living volunteers wearing makeup, but we stage hangings and shootings for the purposes of training. Um, she's uh, showing a uh, defensive wound, which is really very sad when you think about it. Uh, this, this is Dylan Thuris, who is the co-founder of Atlas Obscura, who is a friend. And uh, he wanted to be one of our uh, victims. Uh, so uh, uh, he had a great time. Uh, Atlas Obscura podcast, he did a two-part podcast. If you go to the Atlas Obscura podcast, he did a two-parter about uh, uh, this training facility and what it's like to play dead for us. Uh, he had a great time. So we're probably best known for this collection of dioramas, these little miniatures. They're all in a scale of one inch to one foot. They're all exquisitely detailed um, and just uh, amazingly well-crafted. Each one of these dioramas cost about as much as it costs to build a real house. I mean, uh, the woman who made them literally spent a fortune um, uh, on, on the collection. Uh, this is one just a typical one, I'll break it down for you. This is called Blue Bedroom. Um, this guy worked at the box factory, you can see there in the background. Um, and he uh, has a bullet wound to the head. Uh, there's a gun on the floor. There's some spring going back and forth uh, uh, between the dresser and uh, there and there's the other side of the room. And um, I don't know how they got, they got there. So, but that's what the one, one diorama uh, looks like. 
Uh, they had their first and only public exhibition a few years ago at the Smithsonian, uh, literally right across from the White House. It was uh, quite a quite a thing. It was the second most popular uh, exhibit at the Renwick Gallery up until that time. We were beat by um, Burning Man, um, but um, uh, it was uh, uh, they went on public display. Um, there's I, I just wanted to, a little detour. Uh, the, the nutshell studies won't explain death. They have their own life in, uh, in various places. They have fans all around the world. But at the University of Wisconsin Parkside, um, they have taken things uh, to a real extreme. Uh, two years ago, they started a course on crime scene investigation. And so they decided to recreate uh, this diorama, which is called Dark Bathroom. And they did it in life size. It was done by the theater department. And they, based on the height of the sink, they're able to deduce uh, the proportions of the room. They got a screen capture and they did the wallpaper. Uh, this is a life size diorama uh, that they actually use for a crime scene investigation. I begged them to, this was done by the theater department, so it's all meant to break down. And they didn't keep it. I begged them to keep it, they didn't. Um, but um, uh, this year, they decided to do it again, and they chose a different one. They chose unpapered bedroom that they recreated, and uh, I, I went to go see it. Uh, it was very disorienting to actually be inside the diorama and be able to look around, uh, but this thing is, uh, uh, they set it in the theater, and um, they use it for training um, uh, for the, for the course, and you are able to examine the room and the decedent just as you would in a real scene. And uh, this one they're keeping. So their goal there uh, eventually is, I, I hope, to create a collection of life-size nutshell studies of unexplained death, which would just be absolutely amazing. Uh, if, you are, if you would like, the, either you can get a screen cap or actually all you got to do is send an email to Gimme uh, if you say give me, send an email to give me at brucegoldfarb.com, I will send you uh, virtual reality, 3D VR uh, images that you can put on your smartphone, you hold it up and you look at it, uh, and we'll put you inside the dioramas. That's totally free. Uh, knock yourselves out. But uh, they, these dioramas exist for the purposes of training police officers and uh, practicing their skills on crime scene observation. Uh, and this is part of a homicide seminar that's held at the OCME every year. It's a very well-known seminar that was established by this woman who happens to be the, uh, the subject of my book, Frances Klesner Lee, and she is the mother of forensic science. She is absolutely the only woman to make a major contribution to the field of forensic science, and she absolutely revolutionized everything. She is single-handedly responsible for forensic medicine existing in the United States. If it weren't for her, the medical examiners were office where I work would not exist. But let me tell you a little about her. Uh, she was born in 1878 to uh, a very wealthy couple. Uh, John Jacob Lesnar on the right was a, uh, owned a uh, agricultural, agricultural machinery company that was part of International Harvester. And uh, he owned a, a little piece of, the, at the time was the largest uh, uh, manufacturing company in the world. And uh, Francis's mother, Frances Macbeth Glesner, on the left, was quite accomplished in her own right. She was very skilled in the needle crafts. Um, uh, she was a jewelry maker, a beekeeper. Um, both of them were steeped in culture. They were uh, supporters of the Chicago Symphony Orchestra and the Chicago Art Institute. <clears throat> they had this landmark home built for them in Chicago on Prairie Avenue, which is the uh, Millionaire's Row, wherever all the wealthy people lived. Their neighbors were uh, Marshall Fields and uh, George Pullman. Uh, and uh, this home actually still exists. Uh, it's been uh, restored as a, uh, a Gilded Age residence. Um, it's one of the few remaining original properties uh, on Prairie Avenue that still exists. Uh, but uh, she, uh, Francis and her brother, she had one brother, George, and they were homeschooled. Um, and uh, they were both steeped in, uh, they were taught in the, the, the mathematics and the natural sciences and languages and culture and music and dance and art. Um, uh, Francis was fluent in, in German and Italian, French, 
Uh, she could read and write Latin, uh, just a, an, an amazing education that they were given. Uh, they had a little summer getaway in New Hampshire in the White Mountains um, uh, that uh, they had a, they called it the Rocks. And this estate um, grew to around 1500 acres and had 20 buildings on it and a full-time staff of between 80 and 100 people. This was their house, they called it the big house. And this is where they spent their summers. And Frances, when she was an adult, lived here full time on the rocks on the, on the property. Uh, Frances was, uh, uh, grew up, she got married. Uh, she married an attorney by the name of Blewett Lee. Uh, they were married for a few years, it didn't stick. They had some children and then divorced. And at the time, you know, there wasn't a lot of career opportunities for women, particularly as somebody of the socio socioeconomic status. She wasn't expected to work outside the home. Uh, the jobs that existed were either clerical or housekeeping, menial labor, um, but there weren't a lot of career paths for women. So she didn't do much for most of her life, except for the society lady things, going to receptions and benefits and um, uh, cocktails and parties. Um, uh, she had this uh, quite a artistic inclination. Um, in 1912, her mother made this offhand remark about how wonderful it would be to have the orchestra around the house every day. Uh, they they love the CSO and they went to every uh, concert. And so Francis got the idea of uh, fulfilling that dream by creating the Chicago Symphony Orchestra in miniature. Uh, she did the entire orchestra. Every member of the orchestra is finished to represent their real life counterpart. They were all men, of course, at the time. She did the outfits. Every, every one of them is wearing paper collars, uh, paper collars and cuffs. Uh, a little, uh, uh, they're wearing formal evening wear. Uh, she did all the instruments. Um, and um, uh, they, uh, uh, she did 90 pieces in 90 days. This was done in three months, the entire thing. It's about eight feet long. She even had Frederick Stock, who is the, uh, the conductor of the Chicago Symphony Orchestra, write out by hand on pieces of paper about the size of a postage stamp, the correct arrangement for each instrument. So every musician had the score for his instrument. Um, so uh, she did this in 19, this was given to her mom in uh, January, uh, New, Year's, New Year's Day in uh, 1913. And then the following year, she did a, another miniature in the same scale of one inch to one foot, which is the same scale as the nutshell studies uh, of a very well-known quartet, the Flanzelli Quartet, uh, which were a big deal in the early 20th century. They were basically the Foo Fighters, the string quartets of the time. Um, but um, uh, there's a scene in the book where she had them over at her dinner, uh, and this was uh, concealed in the middle of the table in her centerpiece, and she had it revealed, and they all got excited to see themselves in miniature. Uh, the cello, the instrument, the second on the right, it actually worked. It, it couldn't play it, but it actually made a sound. Uh, but she she did this. Uh, but uh, you know, as I say, she is uh, was a really pivotal figure uh, in forensic medicine. And in order to understand what she did, you have to go back to how things used to be. Uh, and from the time that America was uh, established as a colony, uh, we were on the corner system of death investigation. Uh, the when the, when they were colonized by the Northern Europeans, they brought over English common law with them. So the coroner, the sheriff, the constable, the justice of the peace, um, these are all officials from uh, English common law. And uh, the coroner was the keeper of the pleas of the crown. And uh, uh, that got shortened to crowner, uh, which got corrupted into coroner. But uh, the, the, the crowner, the coroner had a variety of, of responsibilities, mainly centered around money, uh, collecting taxes and, and penalties and fees. They investigated shipwrecks and treasure troves. Uh, the coroner was the person who's, who seized royal fishes, uh, such as sturgeon and porpoise, which were only fit for the palate of a king and wouldn't be eaten by a commoner such as myself. Uh, and the coroner was the person who's authorized to serve papers on a sheriff, or if it were necessary, to arrest a sheriff. Um, back in the day, the sheriff was basically a landlord over a piece of real estate, uh, and they were notoriously corrupt. Um, it's not for nothing that the sheriff of Nottingham is the bad guy in the Robin Hood story. So if you needed to arrest a sheriff, that was the coroner was the person who did that. And 
Also, by the way, they investigated deaths. So the coroner had two questions that they were confronted with. Why did this person die? And who is responsible for this death? Now, one is a medical question, and the other is a question of criminal justice. And the coroner didn't have to know anything about law or medicine or criminal justice or any of it, because what he would do is hold a coroner's inquest. And you get a group of people together. Now, back in the Middle Ages, uh, the coroner's inquest consisted of adult men. And by adult, they meant over the age of 13. Uh, and bear in mind, these are illiterate people back in the day. These were not educated people. These were farmers. So you have a jury of teenage boys um, uh, sitting and uh, considering why somebody died. Uh, many of these people knew the victim. They may have been present when the person died. They may have been related to this person. But nonetheless, uh, the inquest jury was required to look at the body. Um, if you couldn't look at the body, there, it was not a valid inquest. They would hear from witnesses and then they vote. Who thinks it's an accident? Who thinks it's an act of God? It's basically crowdsourcing death investigation, not terribly scientific or reliable, but that's what they did. Uh, this is a late 19th century news illustration of a coroner's inquest. And you see on the, on the right side, there is the jury and they're listening to the witness who's in the witness box. And in between them, there is a table with these gentlemen who are uh, working, those are reporters. That's the press. And they're making sure that any sort of rumor, innuendo, accusation, scuttlebutt, everything gets into the afternoon papers. And everybody knows what's going on inside this investigative and adjudicative process. So believe it or not, we still have coroners. About half the country is still on the coroner system. And in many parts of the country, uh, they, 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 in most places where you find coroners, they're elected. Uh, in states like Missouri, Colorado, New York, many places. Uh, this is, happens to be New Orleans. Uh, vote for me because you know I, I don't know what one coroner promises to do that's different than another one. Uh, but nonetheless, that's what they do. They're elected, they're politicians. So it's important to appreciate that coroners are inherently political. Um, and uh, they get the job because they got more votes, not because they're best at it, not because they're most qualified, not because they have the most expertise. And so there is a tendency towards corruption and incompetence and indifference, which is not to say that all coroners are bad and all medical examiners are good. Uh, there certainly are uh, coroners of uh, uh, good, decent people uh, uh, doing the best of their abilities. And there absolutely certainly are medical examiners who are unfit for the job. But in, in general, there are these differences between them. Uh, and most importantly, the qualifications for a coroner really vary a lot. Um, in, in most of the states, uh, there's absolutely no, no training required to be a coroner, uh, none at all. Um, uh, South Carolina, not long ago, raised the minimum qualification for a coroner to include a high school diploma. Before then, it didn't have to be a high school graduate to be certifying cause of manner of death on death certificates. In many states, I don't want to pick on Missouri, Indiana, Wisconsin, et cetera, et cetera, but this is common in most of these states uh, where they run for office. Uh, you have to live in the state for at least one year. Uh, you have to live in that county, uh, if you're a county coroner, for at least six months. You have to be uh, uh, eligible to hold a public office over the age of 21. Uh, and you have to get more votes than the other guy. That's it. Um, now, by comparison, to be a licensed barber in the state of Missouri and legally cut hair, you have to have 1,500 hours of training and pass the test. In order to be a nail technician and legally give a manicure in Missouri, you have to have 500 hours of training and pass a test. Uh, but if you are elected coroner, you're over the age of 21, you can crack open a beer, you're good to go, or you can start signing death certificates, just like that. Uh, medical examiners, by comparison, they're doctors. So they've done four years of pre-med. You do four years of medical school. Uh, you do a four-year residency. When you graduate medical school, you're a generalist, you're an MD, uh, and then you do your residency in pediatrics or radiology or whatever that specialty is. And that's where you get a specialty. In this case, they do pathology. And at that point, after your residency, you can take your boards, get a job in any hospital or clinical laboratory, and make really, really good money. Or you can have a fellowship uh, in forensic pathology, and you learn about the patterns of injury and illness related to death, and you take your boards and you earn less money. So it's really questionable how smart these people are. They have more training and they earn less pay. But nonetheless, 
there is 13 years of training and education before the first day on the job. So there's a big difference in coroners and medical examiners, just to get that clear um, and then get boarded. So throughout the country, um, there's no particular rhyme or reason to it. Uh, some places have coroners, some have medical examiners, some have both. Uh, it tends to follow uh, political lines where the blue states tend to have medical examiners, the red states tend to have coroners. The population centers on the east of the west coast, the cities tend to have uh, medical examiners. Uh, it's, it, but nonetheless, about half of the US population is still under the jurisdiction of, of coroners. Um, it even gets more granular than that. In a state like New York, for, for example, uh, there are medical examiners in uh, the New York City area, in Erie County, Buffalo, New York, in Rochester, in Albany, but the rest of the state is covered by coroners who are um, elected to office. Now, I grew up um, outside Buffalo uh, in Erie County, and uh, in Erie County, as there is in Baltimore County and, and uh, everywhere else, there is a boundary line where Erie County ends. And there are places throughout New York State where if somebody dies on one side of the street, that death is investigated by a, uh, a, a, a coroner of unknown qualifications who got the job because he got elected. And if somebody dies on the other side of the double yellow line, that death is investigated by a medical examiner who's gone to school and uh, is a civil servant. So how a death is investigated, who does it, under what circumstances, what the qualifications are, where it's done, uh, the, uh, an examination may be done at a hospital or a funeral home, um, literally in some guy's garage. Um, it may not be done at all, or, or in a place like Maryland, it would be done uh, in a state-of-the-art facility where everything's done by consensus and, and uh, everybody's looking at the same thing. So Francis Glesner Lee is the woman who's responsible for that transition from the coroner system to the medical examiner system. Um, she was introduced to it by this guy, George Burgess McGrath. Now, George McGrath was her brother's best friend. They went to Harvard together. George McGrath went to medical school. George Glesner was headed towards law school, uh, but they were best buddies. Uh, and um, Francis knew him She'd known him since she was a 16-year-old uh, uh, in Chicago. They went to the 1893 World's Fair together. She'd known him um, since she was uh, 16. But um, it wasn't until middle age, when she was 52 years old in 1959, uh, 1929, when they rekindled their friendship. Uh, they spent time together in, in Boston. Now, McGrath was, uh, he was a doctor. He was actually trained as a pathologist. And in... Um, 1907, he was appointed as a medical examiner in Boston. Boston had the first medical examiner system uh, office in the country. He was the second doctor to be appointed as a medical examiner in Boston in Suffolk County. He was actually the first pathologist in the United States to be appointed as a medical examiner. He is literally America's first forensic pathologist. Uh, and so uh, when he got the job, um, he realized that he didn't, he was not qualified to be a medical examiner. Uh, the field, which was then called legal medicine, there was nowhere in the country to be trained in legal medicine. So he took a year and he went to Europe to the capitals of legal medicine in Europe. He spent time in Edinburgh and London and Paris and Vienna. And he learned about these principles of scientific death investigation. Um, and he, when he came back to the United States, uh, and he incorporated this into his uh, work as a medical examiner and he, the lectures that he gave to Harvard Medical School. Uh, and so uh, he got this reputation as a crime doctor. He was involved in many uh, really sensational cases at the time. The Avis Linnell case of 1911 uh, was one that just, it was sensational, it was all over the papers uh, and really, really cemented the idea uh, the value of a scientific death investigation. I get into it in the book. Um, the Florence Small murder uh, uh, was another one uh, that was this huge sensational case. Um, the, the Summer Street Bridge disaster, 1916, a streetcar went off uh, an, open, uh, an open bridge. The gate was not down and it went into the, uh, the Boston, uh, the harbor, the channel there. Um, and it was at the time, the, the largest and most complicated um, a disaster that had, uh, in the history of Boston, 
uh, until the 1919 Boston molasses disaster, which was also his, uh, he was the medical examiner in that case that many people are probably familiar with, where there's this massive uh, vat of molasses that ruptured and this wave of molasses went down the streets and knocked buildings off the foundation and crushed people and vehicles and carriages and everything. He was also the medical examiner on the Sacco and Vanzetti case. Um, so, uh, uh, and um, Babe Ruth's first wife, it was very bizarre. Uh, Babe Ruth apparently got married very young when he was 18, 19 years old. And in 1929, his, his ex-wife, uh, estranged wife, they weren't divorced. Uh, his wife was uh, living uh, in uh, uh, Massachusetts, living with a dentist in Massachusetts under an assumed name and then died in a fire. So it was for a week or so, it was this huge story in the papers. Uh, McGrath investigated and turned out that it was, uh, uh, she's died from smoke inhalation. Uh, the fire was due to faulty wiring and there's nothing suspicious about the death after all. Uh, but they spent time together in 1929 and uh, he explained about coroners, medical examiners, uh, about his job. She was absolutely fascinated and it was like a bulb went off in her. She knew what she had to do for the rest of her life. She committed herself um, to uh, uh, spending her life and a great deal of her fortune to uh, fulfill his vision of a medical examiner system. Um, at the time that she got involved, now uh, Boston had the first medical examiner's office in uh, uh, 1877. Uh, the next one, uh, wasn't until 30 years later. New York City had a medical examiner's office in 1918. Um, and then uh, in Newark, New Jersey in 1928, when Francis got involved and she heard about this in 1929, she started getting involved in 1930, 31. Uh, the medical examiners only existed in three cities in the United States. So uh, the rest of the country was still on the coroner system. And Francis realized that in order to get away from the coroner system to the medical examiner system, she called, it was the, the, the three-legged stool of legal medicine. Uh, she said, you need to change the laws. Uh, you need to address the manpower and you need to train the police. So you need to change the laws to abolish the office of coroner and coroner's inquests. And you have to establish medical examiner's offices. This is a very complicated uh, matter in many states. It's, it involves changing the state constitution. Uh, and places that had medical examiners, you need to tweak the laws and, and change them a little bit to give medical examiners more autonomy uh, and independent authority. Because in Boston, for example, where McGrath was a medical examiner, he was the one with the training and knowledge to know when a death is suspicious, but he didn't have the authority to begin an investigation. He had to wait until he was notified by the police or the prosecutors. By the time he knew about it, the person had already been moved and they were in a funeral home or buried or in the hospital. So um, you need to you need to give the, make the medical examiner uh, in charge. Uh, and she worked tirelessly for years in changing laws in many, many, many states, Massachusetts, throughout New England, the Mid-Atlantic, Washington, DC. She helped people in other states, in Oklahoma, Colorado, and uh, California, uh, Illinois. Uh, she was active in many, many, many places. Uh, this next thing you need to do um, is to create more qualified medical examiners. Uh, there still was no place to, to learn um, uh, legal medicine. And so she gave the equivalent of $3.4 million to establish the first program at Harvard Medical, medical School uh, in 1936. Now, basically what she did was to create a field of practice from scratch Nothing like this existed, uh, and she got it going. Uh, this guy, Alan Moritz, uh, was the first chairman of the department. Uh, he was one of the top pathologists in the country. Uh, they worked very, very closely together, um, uh, and um, uh, they collaborated together in the nutshells. Uh, she also, uh, Francis, was a, uh, just a, a, an obsessive collector of books, uh, and she began to collect uh, books on legal medicine, on trauma, and, and criminology. And she acquired all this, just an amazing library, uh, which she then donated to uh, Harvard Medical School to establish the George Burgess McGrath Library of Legal Medicine. 
uh, at the time that she established it in 1933. It was the largest of its kind in the world. Uh, and by the time she had finished her association with Harvard and got done with it, she tripled it. Um, so uh, she did that. She created this body of knowledge uh, for uh, legal medicine. Uh, and she, because of her command of languages, she was very, very well positioned to, uh, and, and her command of the European literature she could read in Italian, German, that she knew people who would be good for translations. So she was uh, very integral in translating foreign uh, uh, textbooks into English for the uh, American audience. Um, so she did that. And then she and um, uh, Alan Moritz duplicated these efforts and they, they helped get other programs similar uh, up and running at University of California, the uh, Medical College of Virginia and, and other places throughout the country. Uh, now, the really key piece uh, is training the police because frankly, back in the day, the police were not exactly the best and the brightest. Um, they, the police were not prized for having intelligence. Uh, they were big dumb guys. Uh, a lot of them didn't have high school diplomas. Uh, they wanted cops to be to, to be to be able to break up a fight and wrestle somebody and bring them into custody. You didn't have to have uh, critical thinking skills. You didn't have to have interview skills if you could beat a confession out of somebody, which is what they did. The third degree was a real thing. So it was important to get police trained in scientific death investigation to make them basically a homicide detective. So she established this seminar in 1945 uh, at Harvard Medical School to train uh, police in uh, the scientific methods of uh, de uh, death investigation, uh, which is um, the, the same seminar we, we do today. She made sure that this program at Harvard uh, had uh, instructional media that was second to none. Uh, aside from the dioramas, um, she made uh, they had these uh, uh, there are examples of entrance and exit wounds, um, uh, gunshot wounds. Uh, she had this made. Uh, this, this collection represents uh, around $35,000 in, in present day money to have made. Um, she also um, uh, had these uh, uh, heads made that show different uh, uh, types of death, uh, shooting, a strangulation, and a, uh, a whatever you call it, uh, not good. Um, and she built, uh, built the dioramas. These were all, uh, they were made for the seminar and that's why they exist. And so it's the same seminar that we hold today. And it's done very, very traditionally, uh, aside from using uh, the, the dioramas, uh, they still go out for a fancy dinner. Um, uh, they don't go uh, and to the Ritz Carlton and have gilt edged china, but it, it's a really, really good meal. I've gone a couple of times uh, and um, they still get the, the diploma. Um, for her work with the police, um, she was uh, commissioned as a captain in the New Hampshire State Police. Now, if you read online, um, it, it annoys me that she's referred to as an honorary captain, which is technically true. She was honorary in Connecticut, Massachusetts, Maryland, Virginia, and a lot of other places. But in New Hampshire, she was the real deal. And she was commissioned as a captain uh, in 1943. Um, she was 66 years old at the time, and she was Captain Lee for the rest of her life. And she had police, she had arrest powers. Uh, she was issued a gold badge that she carried with her all the time. Uh, and she was Captain Lee for the rest of her life. Uh, not honorary, she was a real captain. Um, so uh, uh, another part of her mission was to raise public awareness. Um, and so, uh, you know, she wanted to reach she wanted to change the American minds. Uh, she, she felt that if people knew how the dead, how disrespectfully the dead were treated, they would demand change. And she partnered up with this guy, Earl Stanley Gardner, who developed to be a very good friend of hers. Uh, Earl Stanley Gardner, you know, the, the Perry Mason books. Um, and so uh, he attended the homicide seminar, I believe the first time was 1947. He attended a, a few times. But when she met him, she confronted him. Uh, about his Perry Mason books, they were, they were formulaic and dumb because uh, the police would just make these dumb mistakes. Uh, the, the defense attorney would run circles around the police, make them look like idiots uh, and get his the client acquitted. The end of, you know, she said, you know, this is not the way police are these days. They're intelligent, well-trained people. And he said, you know, if I told the truth, the book would be over in a page and a half. So there has to be something there. 
But um, he did see the light and he did uh, write about forensic science later in his career. The time that she uh, was uh, involved with him was right around the time that CBS was picking up the Perry Mason uh, TV show. So he got a little preoccupied, but he did turn and he made good on his promise. Uh, now, another thing that she did, I, I knew that she was involved in a, with, with a film in some way. I didn't know the whole thing, uh, but she had the, the idea of approaching Metro Goldwyn Mayer Studios uh, and pitched the idea of doing a, a feature film featuring a, a medical examiner. And MGM was intrigued. Uh, it was the late 1940s. Uh, the tastes of the American film going public had changed. Uh, they were much more interested in a documentary style, uh, showing people at their work. And so they sent a writer to uh, Boston, by the way, nobody had done, I'm sorry, no murder mysteries have been done since forever, but there had not been a film featuring a medical examiner. So it was a new wrinkle and an old idea. And they sent a writer to Boston to uh, basically to write what the story would be. And he came up with this treatment for a film that they called Murder at Harvard. And the first draft of Murder at Harvard um, uh, uh, focuses on the homicide seminar and there's a conference table and then there's this elderly woman who's sitting at the table and one of the dioramas and a zoom is in the diorama and it goes into a flashback uh, to the case that McGrath investigated and tells the whole story of the department. And Francis says, no, 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 take me out of it. I don't wanna be in a movie. It's not about me, it's about the subject. So she suggested that they base it on a real case. Uh, they, she suggested they based it on the case of Irene Perry, which was a one that Alan Moritz had investigated uh, about a young woman uh, who was murdered, who was pregnant at the time. Um, and um, so they did that. And, and they rewrote the story, basing it on uh, the case of Irene Perry. They changed a few names, changed a few details. Um, Harvard said, um, we don't want murder in Harvard in the title at all. We don't, nothing, nothing having to do with that take us out of the title. And so they had to rename it Mystery Street, which was released in 1950. Um, but this movie um, uh, takes place, it's the first film that was filmed on location in Boston, stars uh, Ricardo Montalban as a Cape Cod sheriff. They actually have to explain the accent and that his parents came from Mexico. And it's a really, it's, it's, a, it's a tremendous movie. Uh, but it gets into forensic anthropology, ballistics, body identification. Um, this was brand new. Uh, forensic photography. Alan Moritz learned about this when he did his fellowship at uh, in Edinburgh. It had been first um, uh, introduced in the, um, I can't remember the case, but he knew about it uh, from, uh, from uh, Edinburgh. And so this is literally, you know, based on a real case, Changing, changing the names to protect the innocent, ripped from the headlines technology, Mystery Street is the first procedural forensic science drama. It's the first of its kind, uh, the first before Quincy, all CSI, all everything that has come since. Um, you can trace that back to Francis Clister Lee uh, and uh, Mystery Street. I do have the trailer. I don't know how this is gonna, um, I don't know how this is gonna work. Uh, but I have the trailer for the movie. If you'll indulge me, let's see if this if I can get this to work. Otherwise, I'll skip it. Uh, but the trailer is on YouTube. I have the movie. It's a hoot to watch. I don't know if this is going to work because the audio is different. Let me just skip this. Oop. Oh no. You need my help? No, no. I just need to get back to where I was. So, you know, uh, in, in popular culture, Francis is, is shown as, um, I, I remember what happened before. I showed the video and because the audio input, I think is different. It didn't, they weren't, it didn't work out. Uh, but, you know, she's, when you read about her, she's, she's depicted as like this elderly woman with too much time on her hands and sort of this marginal figure, but she really, really was a, a very central and pivotal figure. Uh, and, uh, uh, when she died in 1963, these accolades came from uh, around the world, really. I mean, truly, uh, she was uh, hardly a, um, a, a marginal figure. You know, she was truly uh, one of the world's most astute criminologists. I mean, she was respected and known. 
uh, by people all around the world. Um, and it's only lately that uh, the public is uh, beginning to hear of her and uh, learn of her contributions. Um, so um, that, in a nutshell, uh, is what I have for you. And um, uh, if you like this sort of thing, I, 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 on Instagram, uh, if you, I've been posting uh, close-ups and detail shots and things that the public doesn't get to see of the dioramas. And my kids have encouraged me to do the TikTok, so I'm not doing TikTok. But uh, but I'm I'm going I'm I'm showing each um, uh, uh, diorama and, and doing videos for for all of them. So in any event, that's what I have for you. And I will stop talking at this point. And if anybody's got questions or comments or anything, I would be I'd love to hear it. Wow! Thank you so much, Bruce. That was so informative. Um, does anybody have any questions? I have plenty, so I could, I could go on all day, but, um, does anybody have any questions? Yeah, I've got, I've got a, a question, uh, in, in terms of, uh, anything having to do with the death and dying. And I, by the way, I, I enjoyed the book very much and, and enjoyed the, knowing about the coroner system, uh, switching over to a medical examiner. I, I just wonder where religion comes in. To this there's no mention uh of uh of of religion hers or her father's or how he got she got married i don't know that it makes a difference or plays a part but I, that's what i wonder about can you answer that yeah actually uh she was not terribly religious during her life during most of her life um they, they were not a church going family uh and and uh, religion didn't play a big part in the family's um life um they uh, my understanding is that when she was well on in years by the time she was um in her you know late 70s and 80s when living in the rocks uh that she uh converted to catholicism um my understanding was uh to get regular visits because they have to come around to give communion so it got her people coming out to the rocks um, but you know, I, I, I don't know, I, I don't have the sense that she was a terribly religious person. Okay. Where, where, did, where did her father come from? Was he born here? Her dad, John Jacob, yeah. Springfield, yeah. Ohio. The family, the, both of them, both her mom and dad are from Springfield, Ohio. Okay. Very good. I have a question. I, I did enjoy the book. Thank you. I have a question here from, oh, just lost it, from Lorreen saying, are there any schools named after her? No, not to my knowledge. There should be much more named after her. There is not. Yeah. Um, Diane said, I've actually seen Mystery Street, but didn't realize that I was watching history being made. Why do you think she's not well known outside of her field? It was her choice. Um, it was her choice. Uh, there, there were quite a few, um, you know, she made uh, Life Magazine, um, uh, the Popular Mechanics, um, Saturday Evening Post, you name it. She was in the Boston Globe. And, you know, in, I read just about everything that there was written about her. And it's the same sort of thing over and over and over again. There's this, you know, this old lady making weird dollhouses. And, you know, she... She even said, you know, um, and, and there's a little thing she told her, there's this uh, a bit going back and forth with um, Alan Morris, who, when you look at Life Magazine, um, I mean, she's mentioned, but there's, she's barely mentioned. And, and, and of all the photos, they're all of all men looking at the dioramas. She's, I think there's a barely mentioned. And um, she told uh, Alan Morris, you know, anonymity is fine, you know, just to be in the background. The people who know, know, and otherwise it doesn't really matter. Um, she did not want the attention. She is basically, you know, really a private person. You know, she does not, she didn't want the attention. It's not about the attention. Um, and that was her choice. Interesting. How did you first get interested in her? What was that process for you? I, I kind of stumbled onto him. I, I first 
heard about them in the early 1990s, and I, I wrote about them for uh, the weekly newspaper, the American Medical Association, uh, American Medical News. And I, I just, it was just a, you know, a, an article. Uh, uh, American Medical News paid really, really well for doctors with weird hobbies uh, and interests, just, you know, feature stories. So I wrote about a, a gang of, a motorcycle gang of doctors um, and uh, stuff like that. And so it was just like, you know, one and done. I just did the story. But, you know, people kept wanting me to arrange a visit. And I just sort of kept coming back again and again and again. Um, and but so it was just uh, one of these things, and it wasn't until 2012 when you know the opportunity came up, and I was hired to be the executive assistant to the chief. And and um, I mean they were pretty much you know dumped on me because I was the new guy, and uh, Jerry D, who's the keeper of the nutshell secrets, pretty much threw the keys at me and said, "Now it's your problem. You can deal with it. You can change the light bulbs." And said, okay, all right. Did you know much of Francis's story before you started working there or? I, well, I'd written about her. So I knew, I knew the same, I had the same misinformed concept about Francis Glessner Lee that you read over and over and over again, everywhere uh, online. Uh, and I knew, um, you know, bits. I knew that she was wealthy, you know, I, I, there's so much misinformation about her. And I had heard, you know, and I probably repeated that she was forbidden to go to college. It turned out to be not true, absolutely not true at all. Um, so, you know, I didn't know. People would ask, you know, why did she do this? I mean, it's a really simple, obvious question. Why did she do this? How did she choose these cases? Um, those are the things that people wanted to know. And so I didn't know the, you know, the whole story. I didn't know the story until I got into it. Okay. How did um, dioramas get to Maryland? Good question, Victor. Um, they were at Harvard Medical School. And when Francis died in 1962, Harvard lost interest in uh, the, the whole department. Um, they just pulled the plug on the department. And so the guy who was the chief here at the time, Russell Fisher, and he was chief from 1949 until 1983 or 84. Um, uh, Francis actually recommended him for the job here. He'd been through the Harvard program. And so he went to Harvard and he said, um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll do the seminar in, in Baltimore. And they said, great, you, you take them. They, my understanding was I've heard from people who have worked at, at the, in, in, at Harvard that they were headed to the dumpster. Um, they did not want to keep them. Uh, by by the 1960s, they were 30 year old artifacts that were like you know old and dusty. And like you look at something from the 1970s, 1980s, and you think you know why why is that of interest? Um, but uh, he did preserve them. I don't know if Victor might know what happened to the one that was destroyed. There were 20 of them. I don't uh, know. But one, I don't know if if all of them came to Maryland or if one of them got uh, damaged in between. But one of them got destroyed. Yeah, I don't know the story on that one. Uh, how and so because uh, she recommended Dr. Fisher for Maryland's position, that he was the first medical examiner in the state of Maryland. Actually, there was Howard Maldice before him. He was from 1939 to 1949. Uh, but Howard Maldice, who was at the University of Maryland School of Medicine, he was a pet. He was a pathologist, but he was more of an infectious disease guy. Uh, but yeah, he had been the Baltimore City. Um, he was the Baltimore City medical examiner um, when the state went the statewide when they passed the Medical Examiner Act, made the statewide system in 1939. So he became the state medical examiner. I read part of the beginning of that uh, that law as as Dr. Fisher passed it out at the medical school class something about the funding for the medical examiner's office was originally tied to the racing commission in the state of Maryland. That is correct. The, the, the fund for the, for the medical examiner came from the racetrack. That is correct. That's a fascinating connection. <laughs> it is quite fascinating. I'm not quite sure what explanation he, Dr. Fisher gave at the medical school lectures about that. I don't remember that part of it. I just remember reading it in the pages that he has passed out. But in, from my own personal ex experience or interest, 
whenever I saw his name on the calendar for medical school lectures near the end of the pathology year, I would always flag it in my calendar to be there. Uh, and what was interesting was that a lot of his slides were still three and a quarter by four slides and you had to push them through the projector by hand. And so I was back in the projection booth pushing slides through his projector. Talking about the lantern slides? That's correct, sir. I found his lantern slides from the JFK assassination. Oh my goodness. I know. I, yes. Yeah. I, I worked with Victor uh, at, at the <laughs> University of Maryland in 1980, it was a while ago. Yeah, right. Uh, but, uh, and, and he'd been there I mean, long before I was. So, I mean, he, he was already, he'd been quite experienced there for. Well, I'll never remember, never forget some of the cases he talked about. Uh, and ever since that, I will never, ever work under my car without <laughs> the car being on body stands. Because he talks about a guy that went to the garage, a commercial garage he owned, to work on a car over the weekend when there was nobody else there. And the jacking system failed and there were no, no car jacks to keep him from being crushed. Yeah, it happened. He actually was not crushed. He suffocated because he couldn't get enough excursion with his diaphragm to breathe. Yeah. All right, there's some other questions here. Yes. Uh, Lorena asks, how has, has any of her children picked on her work? Actually, no. Um, her son, um, John, uh, actually was a uh, aeronautical engineer. Uh, design fighter jets uh, and, and those sorts of things. Um, and uh, he actually wrote a book and, and, uh, and plane design. Um, but uh, the, of the extended family, and there are Glesners and Glesner Lees, and they're, they're all over. There's dozens and dozens of them. They're all amazing people. They're all quite accomplished. I mean, there's a marine biologist. There's you know, just great people, but none of them in law enforcement that I, that I know of, but none of them have followed in, in uh, forensics. That's interesting. Have you met any of her descendants? Many. Um, really? I've met many. I had, when I, um, in uh, 2015, we had a special um, uh, for the homicide seminar uh, it was the, whatever it was, the 80th of the, of the um, homicide seminar. Uh, and uh, we invited all the family to attend and I had dinner. Um, I sat between her two surviving grandchildren. Um, and, and that was quite, I got to, you know, yeah, I met, met a lot of them. That must've been amazing. The good folks. Um, I have a question here from Diane. Are, you, are her contributions mentioned in forensic textbooks? She is known in some circles, not mentioned so much in textbooks. She's known the way Gus Vollmer is known. And people probably have no idea who Gus Vollmer is, but he's a big deal in police sciences. And so, you know, within, like, you know, in, in forensic pathology, you know, it's, it's, there's, a, there's like a subset. Some people... You know, have heard of her, uh, but she really is not in. Um, you know, there should be the. No, she's not really uh, in a lot of. I'm working at. I'm working at, and hopefully, you know, new generations of books when when they write going forward that, you know, her her contributions will be acknowledged. Mm -hmm. But um, she's only known within, you know, homicide detectives and forensic pathologists and a few. And also, I'm sorry, artists and miniatures. She's known within miniatures. Um, but, you know, they just know her as a miniature maker and they don't, the whole thing is, you know, what she did is uh, people, don't, even people know about her, don't know that she was, you know, was involved in the lobbying and all the other things too. Well, I was really fascinated reading the book to find out exactly how much influence she had. And it seemed like a lot of it stemmed from her philanthropy and her just funding everything, but it seemed to go much deeper than that. Was was she was it just was it just that she was paying for things and people were like, okay, we'll do it? Or was it her enthusiasm for it? Or was it her like I'm I'm just curious like what you think that was that made her so successful? Or was it just that it was something that that worked? that people were starting to see worked? 
Oh, it took convincing. It, it really takes convincing. Um, it's, it's a really uphill battle to convince people, uh, just like trying to sell prevention. It's a really tough sell because you're talking about things that don't happen. Um, there, you know, there's all kinds of uh, complex things. I think that what it was, for one thing, you know, everybody, everybody suspects that she's, they asked whether she was avenging a murder or something like that. Is it about catching murderers? Um, actually, no, she was more concerned about people accused of crimes that they didn't commit. You know, it, it, it's two sides of the same coin, clearing the innocent and convicting the guilty. And she was more concerned about clearing the innocent um, than convicting the guilty. Um, and um, I think it was that you know, she saw this great need. There, there's this great injustice being done. Nobody's doing anything about it. And she was really angry that nobody's doing anything about it. The National Research Council did this report in, uh, what was it, 1928, 27, 28, uh, on uh, coroner's medical examiners, this landmark paper that made all these recommendations. And, uh, uh, you know, several years later, she confronted the, you know, the author, the guy, the Rockefeller Foundation that actually funded that study. And she said, what's been done since then? You, nothing. Is this sort of sitting in my... Is this gathering dust in my drawer? Well, you know, you've got the blueprint. You know what you got to do. Why aren't you doing it? So, you know, um, it was something to do. I think that she was deathly bored with her life. Um, that, you know, she, how many cocktail parties can you go to? How many receptions, you know, and these things. And, you know, it, you talk about the decorative arts, you know, uh, you know, another talk about etchings or watercolors, or whatever it is. You know, this was something that was, of real import and, and needed to be done and uh, nobody was doing it. And so it, it energized her. It really invigorated her and gave her something, uh, I think it extended her life. You know, she had all kinds of problems and mobility and health, uh, but it really did seem to fire her up to, you know, wage battle against these forces and push for the medical examiner system. Well, my read on reading the book about that was that she wanted to have purpose in her life beyond what you just mentioned, cocktail parties and paying calls and, and going shopping for food or clothing. Uh, she wanted to have a purpose in this life because she wanted to use her wealth and resources to change, She's, to bring about, bring about change. She said that she always, that she felt uh, that she, you know, she never had to work to earn what she had. Uh, and that she felt an obligation to do something with that. And, and that's what she said, yeah. Um, somebody asked, was she alive to see the use of DNA? Actually, no, DNA was isolated right around the time that she died. Um, so no, Watson and Crick uh, did that, what was it, like 1960 or something like that, she died in 62, not really. Uh, but blood, blood typing, blood typing had been done that uh, dates from uh, just after World War II, but not, not DNA matching, no. Mm. That makes sense. Um, I had no idea about, about the history of the coroner system and how it's still so all over the place and the corruption. And I, I mean, I vote. I didn't know that. I mean, I guess I live in a place where it's not an elected position, but, um, but still, but, I mean, I, I had no idea about any of that. And are there, um, efforts, ongoing efforts to change that? Or, or is it something that's just kind of the way it is and not really going to change? And There hasn't been any progress uh, in the, the last state to go from uh, coroner to medical examiner was 1992, 96. There has not been any progress since then. Um, it's, it's very, very slow going. Um, I mean, you can see from 18, 1877 to 1918, you know, how it's just been, the whole thing has been glacial. Um, and it's, it's terribly political. Um, local, you know, the coroner is a local position. Uh, nobody wants to give up a local authority to the state. Uh, there's expenses, the costs that are involved, you know, to establishing a medical examiner's office, there's upfront costs. Um, so it's just becomes one of these things. And then you get the special interests, the funeral homes, the coroner association. Um, and it's just, and there is nobody. We need another 
Francis Glister Lee. And I, honestly, I feel like I'm doing my little part by raising awareness of people such as yourself, you know, and making this, you know, trying to make this a, a, a subject for discussion. Um, I don't expect to see a whole lot of change in my lifetime, um, but uh, people need to know, and people need to know there's a better way. Uh, and, um, you know, the, but the, the, we, need, we need somebody like her today, but there isn't, there's nobody really taking that charge. Huh. I, I really had no idea. <laughs> um, it's you. No, I have plenty of other things to do with my life. <laughs> um, I would love to know a little bit about your research process. Did, did Francis leave behind a ton of papers? Was there a lot of material that was easy to find? Did you have any real major surprises along the way? All the above. <laughs> Let me tell you, let me, there's, I, I don't know if you can experience the, I don't know if you quite call it panic. When you sign a contract with a publisher that says that you will produce a manuscript of 80,000 words. Um, and that means that there's going to be 80,000 words there. And I, I had a good idea of maybe two thirds of it, uh, of, uh, uh, you know, I knew that she was involved in the film and, and these sorts of things. Um, but I, I had a real fear that I would get to, I don't know, you know, 50,000, 60,000 words. And I've said everything that there is to say about it. And I, you know, oh, my God, now what? So I really didn't know going into it, what would I, what I would encounter? Um, so when I got the okay, this is interesting. You may find this interesting. My only piece of equipment was my phone. Um, all it took with me, I used a, a cam scanner, uh, an app that makes PDF documents. Um, so I brought no laptop. I brought no scanner. Um, I, I ran up to Boston. I spent um, um, three days. Uh, I did two trips. I did two, two to Boston. One, I can't remember now. Um, but I spent uh, several days up in Boston at the... Uh, uh, the Countway Library and the Center for History of Medicine going through um, McGrath's papers and the Department of Legal Medicine. And I was just copying page after page after page. I was just, you know, I had no, I, I didn't want to take the time to read it. You know, I just copy, 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 and I copied everything I could find. I did the same thing in when I got to Chicago. Now, Francis did not keep a journal. Um, and, um, I, you know, I, I, I knew going into it, it, it could be done. One of my favorite books recently was uh, The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks. Uh, now, Rebecca Skloot, uh, all she had of Henrietta Lacks was one photograph. It had no writing, there had no nothing. Um, so, you know, in a, I was in a similar situation in that the subject of your book is not available. You know, there's, you don't know there may not be stuff there, but she could do it. I figured I could do it. Um, but I, I went to Chicago where the family, um, at the Glesner house, um, they had done a job to uh, get all the papers that were in uh, the rocks and everything. They had 50 file boxes okay. of papers up in Boston. And they had already had graduate students uh, go through and sort of condense the stuff that was Francis. Uh, Francis Glesnerly's material. Um, so I copied all of that, and for good measure, uh, I went through everything. Um, they, uh, Bill Tyre, who is the curator of the Glesner House, uh, he got permission from the family, so I was the authorized biographer. He gave me unfettered access to everything, even confidential information, financial records, tax records, medical records. Um, that nobody had gone through everything before. He wasn't even aware uh, about the the book that she that she wrote, um, it was all in the papers. So, you know, I I just copied and then I came back literally with thousands of pieces of paper. I printed everything out and I spent that summer organizing things um, uh, chronologically um, and also geographically. So uh, I had uh, New Hampshire, Chicago, uh, uh, and Boston, and so. I, I every, just this massive, massive collection of papers. And I realize um, that um, all I have to do is, 
is report on historical facts. I, I, I'm a reporter, I can do that. Uh, so I'm just re reporting as I see it. And I was amazed um, that everything was right there. Um, I found uh, the good guys and the bad guys. People ask, you know, what got her motivated uh, to this? I, I was astounded to find in Francis Glesner Lee's own words, the exact moment, the thing that got her pushed in that direction, which was this offhand remark by George Burgess McGrath about the beauty of uh, the, the human organs and how lovely they'd be as a uh, piece of art. Um, and, um, you know, that just, it just blew my mind. I mean, what a, what a beautiful thing, um, you know, that she did have that moment and, and to know what it was. Uh, and, and even this, you know, the call to action at the end, the whole, the, the story was there. All I had to do was tell it. Uh, and it was just extraordinary that there was a beginning in the middle of the end, there it had natural uh, highs and lows and there was drama and, 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 uh, uh, and, it was just, it was just amazing. And, and I, I just felt fortunate um, that, you know, it was a good subject, uh, that the material was there. And, and uh, really, you know, I feel like a translator, you know, I, it's not, you know, I'm just telling what happened. I didn't do this stuff, you know. Uh, so, um, you know, I just feel fortunate that I was the one in position to actually get to know the story first and commit it to paper is all I did. <laughs> That's great. I, I imagine that must have been thrilling. It was, I I consider myself her biggest fan, you know, I adore her. Uh, and yeah, so to find out these things, uh, I, I knew that she'd taken a trip with Earl Stanley Gardner and spent two weeks traveling together. And, I, you know, I just, I, I relished, it was so difficult. You know, I, I wanted to get to that. I want to know what that trip was like, but I, you know, I had to, I got to wait and, you know, those sorts of things, reading the correspondence and, uh, and that sort of stuff was just, it was awesome. That's great. Carol is wondering, and I was hoping to ask you this as well. What's your next project? Uh, if you have one, I'm, or if you can talk about it, you can totally lie to me if you want to. <laughs> I, I have a book in print that uh, will be released next February. I, I don't know if I'm quite ready to let That's the cat bag yet, but it's it's sort of related. If I, I think that. Um, um, I think people will be interested. I, I don't want to say publicly and something that's going to be recorded and uh, maybe, but yes, yeah, I got something that's coming out um, in uh, next February. That's very exciting. I got stuff in the works. That's I know I'll be. Totally understand. <laughs> um, does anybody else have any other questions? I have a couple sort of smaller ones. Go for it. Um, one is, do you have a particular favorite detail of the nutshells? I got lots of de favorite details about the nutshells. Uh, one, all the figures are wearing underwear. That's amazing. <laughs> um, um, there's a lot of things that you can't see. Uh, there's a lot of things that she did that were, there's one called Saloon in Jail, uh, where there's the skyline and the sidewalk in front of this bar, and then there's a jail cell next to it. Um, inside the bar, there's a, there's a, you, there's a poster that hangs facing the bar. You can't even see it from the outside. You cannot see this poster from any possible angle unless you were six inches tall and walked inside and turned around and looked behind you. But there's a poster for a boxing match. I've got it posted on Instagram. Uh, we got pictures of the, but you know, there's, the, there's a boxing poster inside the bar um, that you know, totally, it doesn't mean anything. You can't, nobody can see it, but she knew it was there. And inside the jail cell, um, she put little graffiti on the on the wall. Uh, as you know, nobody ever sees it, nobody ever notices it. But you know, if you if you just look in the right place, and there it is. Were these intended to be viewed from a particular vantage point, as, or as they are? Okay. They were intended to be behind dark cabinets at okay. eye level for the the average height of an adult. Okay. Like, Male, I'm sorry, because they're they're meant for police officers, so they're uh, they're at, at basically eye level. In the in that whole bunch of photographs that you had sent to me, I think the favorite little thing that I had found were the potato peels. It's like, why? That's amazing. Just you really enjoyed throwing in a, just a lot of extraneous detail. 
Um, and, you know, she, she knew that she was doing, she was creating, she didn't want them to be toy-like, you know, she had to be really immersive and she wanted people to get, she didn't, she never said to suspend disbelief, but she wanted people to get into that universe. And so she just jammed them full of detail to help you lose yourself and to immerse yourself into this experience. But, and, and, and it's just like everything, there's so many red herrings. There's so many things in it that you don't know what to look at. And, and so you have to look at everything. Well, isn't that the, isn't that the, the business of, a, of an investigator to look at all the things that they can observe and figure out which ones are relevant to their understanding of what happened and exactly. what is not relevant? Exactly so right. the potato peels do have a relativity in the sense that they most likely did not have anything to do with the cause of this person's death, but the investigator has to rule that out. That's true. I mean, you don't know. And, and it does, you know, uh, part of her purpose was not uh, uh, just the facts of the, of the death itself, but to tell you about these people who lived there. Mm -hmm. So a lot of these details are really just about the setting um, what the potato peels tells me, obviously, is that woman had recently peeled potatoes. Um, so, you know, you have to fit that into the context of whether the, you know, what state of mind she was in uh, before she was found dead. Um, but, um, you know, if, if I, I've seen people set up these crime scene rooms and you see it where it's the back of a room and there's a body and there's a weapon and there's blood and you walk in and you know, because it's the only thing there that you're supposed to look at. And you, and you play these video games and you hold the cursor over it and it lights up and oh that's what you're supposed to touch but you know it's it's just that you really don't know um and she had a particular way of training people you have to force yourself there's such a tendency to walk into a scene you see something there's blood or whatever it is and and you you're already beginning to think and you're formulating an idea and so there's a tendency towards noticing things that fit into your hypothesis and it overlooking things that don't. So you really have to force yourself to keep an open mind. And she suggested that people, you start at your left and you go in a, in a, in a clockwise rotation around the room from the edge towards the middle and you have to make yourself look at everything. Mm. It's, I mean, it's, it's incredible because with all of that detail, I imagine you really have to look. That's why when they're assigned for the homicide seminar, they have all week uh, to look at it. Wow. And so these guys, the officers do, and they spend about what they do at a real crime scene. Some of them spend hours and they talk among themselves and they really, really, really give it serious study. It's incredible that they're as useful now as they were then. Because there is no substitute. You can't yeah. do it any other way. They still, there's nothing better than a, a, a live 3D object to look at. Yeah, amazing. How did the FBI feel about her act, her work? <sighs> they, um, she met J. Edgar Hoover. Um, she pushed her way into the FBI and got a meeting with J. Edgar. Um, he was not a big fan of women in general. Um, and um, uh, they, they basically brushed her off. Now, you know, she urged the FBI. Uh, that was a, an area, this is right during the time, 1930s, uh, when they were setting up their crime lab uh, after the, um, the the Lindbergh baby. Uh, uh, so they were getting you know, these things up and running. And she correctly pointed out to J. Edgar Hoover that they don't have a strength in forensic pathology. They don't have a strength in forensic medicine, which is true then and is still true today. The FBI does not, it's not their forte is uh, uh, forensic pathologists. Crime scene, trace evidence, that kind of stuff, yes. Uh, but not the medical stuff. Um, and they, um, um, they uh, uh, treated her politely, but, you know, gave her the brush off. They, they didn't really take her seriously. Mm. Interesting. Mm. Lastly, how do you think Francis would feel about pop culture's obsession with forensics and true crime and murder and all of that? Do you think she would be horrified or... I think that she would be very, very pleased that so many people are so knowledgeable of forensic science. Um, I think that she would be terribly uh, embarrassed that she is, uh, I, I, you know, I think that she would be, would she be more happy, pleased to know that she was on display at the Smithsonian? 
you know, she never intended to make art. Um, and I don't know how she would feel about that. Um, I, I don't think that she would want the attention paid to her. I, that she, you know, there's there's still been so little progress um, and there's still so much to do. And I think that she would not, um, she would still say the same thing today that she said then that, you know, we, we've got to do better than this and, and you know, uh, and push for medical examiners coast to coast. Hmm. Well, does anybody else have any questions? I think I'm all out. All right. So Bruce, thank you so much. This has really been excellent. It's been so great talking to you and thank you for writing such a fascinating book about such a fascinating woman. Thank you. And uh, I'm, I'm glad that you brought her out of the shadows of history. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And uh, I look forward to going back next year with the next book. Excellent. Can't wait. I will reach out to you for sure. <laughs> right. Thank you all. Nice to see you, Victor. Nice Thank to see you too. Thanks for having me. It was a great read. Thank you, Victor. That's very kind. Your check's in the mail. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you, everybody. Thanks a lot. All right. Bye-bye.